Thank you. Why don't we take our seats? Thank you, team, for leading us so well. It's great to be in my home church, and it's nice to see mainly familiar faces and also some unfamiliar faces, which is also a, a thrill. Um, hey, Chris McHugh, great to see you, brother. Um, Chris, Chris is a freshly minted gold medalist for Australia, Australia, as I like to call it. And um, I don't know, hands up if you're watching the men's beach volleyball. Okay. Wow. It was just tense, Chris. It was tense. So, um, hey, ha have, you got, have you got the gold medal? You're on kitchen. He's just serving Jesus in the kitchen. Gold medalist serving Jesus in the kitchen. Hey, why don't we put our hands together for Chris? That's amazing. And uh, he may or may not wear it while he's dishing up lunch. Who knows? Um, <laughs> we're going to have 300 people for lunch today. Praise God. Um, but I rang my sister after. She's like a Commonwealth Games junkie. She was meant to go up, but um, she wasn't able to go for health reasons. And um, I rang her and she goes, I said, are you watching it? She goes, I can't watch it. I have to walk out. And then I walk back in. And Channel 7 did interesting things to us, Chris, but it, it helped me out anyway, helped my stress levels. But, mate, you had a lot of people uh, praying for you and cheering you on, mate. So we're really proud of you. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm so proud now that... that now that I'm not here every week, I, I feel like I'm that relative that's just looking on from a distance, so proud. Um, just this week, uh, I read a, a blog article from a young man in our church called Lewis Daly, um, and it was about how he was invited to present to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation about some work he's doing with apps in helping people in the developed world with their wells and all this sort of stuff. And, and it's kind of like a blog article about how to engage with high-profile, important people. And, and I'm just thinking, he didn't even, he doesn't tell people about these sorts of things, but I'm so proud of um, people in our church and particularly some of the young people that are just rising up in areas, spheres of influence and being great witnesses to Jesus, but also being in spheres where, you know, they can inspire people. And, yeah, so whether it be in the sporting landscape or academia, it's thrilling. And so I'm like a proud relative looking on from a distance now. So... Yeah, um, I could say I could embarrass more people, but that's about it. That's enough from me. It's really fantastic to share about the Jesus way because the, the, the passage of the Bible that this series is based on is John chapter 14, where Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. And Jesus speaks some amazing truth. And he also shows us a way of life. He shows us what life is in all of its fullness can be. But this aspect of the way is really important because my observation is the way is kind of like the key that unlocks the truth and the life. In fact, you can have truth and you can have principles for living, but if you don't know the way to live, then you will never fully get to express the life that you've been created to live. So, for instance, my son, Josiah, often will see me looking at a... A, a, a instructions on a, on a Lego um, instructions and he'll see that I'm struggling and he will actually show me how to do it. And once I've seen it, or, or a toy, like I'm trying to pull that part of toy or put one back together and he just, he just, you know, he's got these massive mitts for a five-year-old and he just comes along and he just shows me. I'm like, oh, is that how you do it? And he just sees it quicker than me and it's really cool. And so in return, I'm trying to teach him how to um, tie his shoelaces. Well, I've, I've taught him a couple of times. His mum's done most of it, but I, I'm still going to claim a little bit of credit. Um, but how many people know that if you were to give a child some instructions on how to tie shoelaces, it's going to be no help whatsoever. They have to be shown the way. Shown the way. And when they see it, and then they do it, and then they make mistakes, and then they see it, and then they do it, eventually they learn the way the way of the shoelace, whether it's the two loops or whether it's the one loop with the, you know, I'm more of a one loop kind of guy, but Josiah likes the two loops for some reason. His mother and I are not united on this at all. <laughs> and, and so many things in life. Imagine someone that's really socially awkward teaching them about how to invite a girl out on a date or invite a guy out on a date. 
and you write all the principles down. Let me tell you, if you just give some principles, say, do this, do this, do this, they could do all the right things and it still doesn't work. Because unless you see someone and you see, okay, some basic ways of relating and like the body language and kind of picking up signals and all that sort of stuff, it doesn't work. We have so much of the way we learn things is by observing not just what happens, but the way it happens. Are you with me? And so much of that is true of Jesus, that it's not just a mechanical transference of religious principles, but he's pointing to himself because his disciples are anxious in John 14. They're anxious because he said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And they're just thinking, where are you going, Jesus? Because this sounds pretty scary. It sounds like it's going to involve death and it's going to involve pain and it's going to involve us not being with you anymore. And you're going away to prepare a place for you. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And so he's comforting them. And in the midst of comfort, he says, I am the way. Because Thomas says, how do we know the way? And Jesus says, I'm the way. And so he essentially answers the question by pointing to himself. And he says, and when I was reading it, I thought he takes on the tone of a father. Because he doesn't just give principles and instructions. He doesn't give commands like, you know, like, a bishop or a pope or a, he doesn't even speak like a lord. He speaks like a father because later on he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And, 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 and if you want to know what the father's like, stay close to me. And he speaks to them like a father and he says, if you want to know the way to the father, stay with me. I'm the way. It's like he's saying, if you want to know the way to life, if you want to know the way to the place that I'm going, stay close with me and I won't just teach you truth and the way of life. I will show you and embody the way. Stay with me and I will be the way through which you access the Father. Stay with me because you need to access through me and you can't do it apart from me, so stay with me. And so Jesus was the way and he taught them the way all the way to the cross. And so Jesus actually showed them the way to the Father was through his life and his death and eventually his resurrection. And so part of the way of Jesus is his goodness. And that's what we're talking about this morning, the goodness of Jesus. And you might just think, well, of course, everything Jesus did was good because he's God and what God does is good. And of course, we can think of Jesus' kindness and we can think of his miracles and they're all good, but we're not going to talk about them so much this morning. We're going to talk about the fact that the goodness of Jesus looks very different to how I think we sometimes imagine the goodness of God. You see, Jesus is God up close. Jesus is God with skin on. Jesus is a picture of God that you can't walk away and say, I don't know what God looks like anymore. You can't say, I don't know what God's like anymore. You you can still have a heap of questions, but you can't say God hasn't shown what he's like to me because he has revealed so much of his heart and so much of his face and so much of his character. He is God enfleshed amongst us. And the way of Jesus is that he is always good. That God, even when God doesn't, it doesn't look like he's doing good, that God is not just, he doesn't just do good, he is good. Just like he is love and he is holy, he is good. And even when there is evil and bad, he will work it for good because his character is good. And the way of Jesus is always good. But let me tell you that Jesus is not always easy and he's not always nice. In fact, I think if a lot of people think about Jesus, we like to domesticate Jesus into being a blonde-haired, blue-eyed animal hugger. For some of you that vote for the Greens, he might be a tree hugger. Um, <laughs> I, saw this, I saw this meme of some like extreme right-wing Christians in America with Jesus hugging a gun. I thought, yeah, that's just sad. That's just wrong. Um, Anyway, (laughs) it's like, sorry, I'm not with you on that one. The way of Jesus is always good, but not always nice. You see, Jesus, this is my feeling of Jesus, that he challenges our concepts of goodness to the point where if you read the Gospels correctly, there will be aspects of Jesus' life and teaching that you should disagree with at first that clash 
with something on the inside and you're like, that doesn't fit my idea of Jesus. So what do we do? We just skip that bit until we find the bit we like. Or we, we move forward and we're reading the Sermon on the Mount and we read the bit about blessed are the peacemakers and we, we like that. But then when it gets to the bit about love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you, we're just like, yeah, and yeah, let's keep on reading. So what are some ways that Jesus is good but not always nice? Because I think that often we think as Christians the goal of our life is not to do bad things and not to upset people. But Jesus upset people and he didn't live for the praise of others. He lived for the purpose and the mission that God put on his life. And that meant that there was lots of good things he didn't do because he was doing the best thing that the Father had put on his heart. It was the purpose of God for his mission to lot, to, for life. And it was to head to the cross. And it was to teach and to, and to leave the legacy of his life, but ultimately would lead to the cross. There was a whole pile of things Jesus couldn't do that were good and nice, and he chose not to. Remember Jesus at the wedding at Cana when he's a little boy, and his mum wants him to do a miracle. And he looks at his mum, he's like, Mom, do you really think this is the time? What about when Jesus is 12 and his parents, they lose him for like a couple of days. They, well, it's a day before they realise he's gone. Have you seen Home Alone? Kevin! <laughs> Kevin! <laughs> well, Jesus, his parents were negligent. I mean, the Department of Social Services would have been called and said, you have lost your child for more than 24 hours. You are bad parents. But, you know, they, what was their excuse? We thought he was with family. Yeah, right. <laughs> they were just like, we just need a break from this. This kid, he's just like, he thinks he's a carpenter. He just keeps on banging stuff and we just want a break from him. You know, like, who knows? Anyway. I read that into the text. Um, and Jesus at the temple at 12 years old, and he comes back and his parents are upset. They're not happy. And they share their heart with their son. And they're like, what have you done to us? And Jesus basically rebukes them and says, guys, I'm where I'm meant to be. What are you doing? You should have known I'd be here. Jesus expressed his anger. Yes, anger. By aggressively... In my original notes, I had violently, but I changed it because it might be too offensive. He aggressively removed people from the temple courts with a whip. It was not a feather. I checked the Greek. It was a whip. <laughs> Jesus was actually quite harsh towards a, um, a Syrophoenician woman. You know that woman that says, please come and help my daughter. She's possessed by a demon. And he basically dismisses her. Do you read that bit in the text? Jesus, can't you just be nice? <laughs> like, Jesus, isn't it? you're amazing, but this sounds a bit harsh. And, and you've got to read it in its context, and it's a great illustration of the mercy of God, but it doesn't fit our cookie-cutter picture of Jesus being beholden to the needs of other people all the time or the agendas of other people. In fact, his bigger agenda was bigger than the agenda of each human being, although he gave incredible dignity to human beings. But he was not a slave to it. And at times, he doesn't fit the box, and I don't like that. In Matthew 23, he's speaking to some very zealous religious leaders, and he calls them hypocrites, snakes, a brood of vipers, and who will be condemned, condemned to hell. And hell is the absence of the presence of God. Tim Keller says, if, you, if your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshipping an idealised an idealized version of yourself. I wonder, do you disagree with what Jesus says about sexuality and marriage? Do you disagree with him on it? Do you disagree with what he says about possessions and the love of money? Do you disagree with him when he talks about loving your enemies? Do you disagree with him when he says, if you really want to know the way to life, you have to Give up your rights for life and you have to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. Because let me tell you, there should be something in you that is honest enough to say, I don't like that. I don't like that. I mean, I like the bit where Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But that's good for me. But, and, and all of his commands and all of his teachings are good for me. But they're not nice and they're not easy. The way of Jesus. Jesus lived such a life that people wanted to kill him. You know, Jesus, there's this story in Luke 8 when 
Jesus' mother and brothers are, are brought, they're, they're outside and his friends say, your mum and brothers are outside. And he proceeds to say, my, my, my mother and brother are those who hear God's word and put into practice. In another one of the, the gospels, he says, basically everyone here is, you're my family. And he ignores his mum. I mean, good luck getting away with that, some of you sons. You get a clip across the year and abusive text message from your mum. How dare you ignore your mother? But let me tell you, Jesus was making a point because Jesus loved his mother dearly. He thought about her on the cross. He loved his family. I mean, his mother was his closest disciple, the most godly woman. I think the most godly person in the Bible outside of Jesus is Mary. I think you can make a really good case for her being the, the greatest hero in the Bible outside of Jesus. I think we should respect her greatly. But... Jesus is making a point because the context of that passage in Luke chapter 8, he's just been talking about the obstacles to the good news of the gospel going forth and how we don't put our light under a bushel and, the, the, and how the seed of God goes out but it gets trampled by, 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 by the, the, the worries of life. And so he's talking about the gospel going out and the kingdom of God expanding. And then his family is trying to get his attention. He's making a point that you cannot put family above the kingdom of God. So it's actually in context, but Jesus is not nice and he does not enslave himself to the expectations of others. And that's really hard. Now, I don't think, now some of you that are particularly prickly by gift, this is not designed to anoint you to be not nice. In fact, I think there's nothing wrong with being nice, but just that niceness is not a virtue above being good. In fact, sometimes if someone says to you, hey, I have a gift. God's called me to sing on Australian Idol. And they can't sing. Don't be nice to them. (laughs) Speak the truth and say, don't go on that show because they will put you on there for the highlights reel alone. And they will laugh at you. This is the most challenging story and the most amazing story that I disagree with about Jesus' priorities. In fact, this, let me tell you, if you're in this situation... I think 99.9% of us would have massive issues with this story. We would get angry with Jesus and we would get passionate about it and we'd be wrong. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? I think most of us in this room, people with the Holy Spirit of God living in us, if we're in this situation, we would disagree with Jesus and he'd be right because he gets to choose what's right and wrong. He gets to choose what's good and what's not. Let's read this. You're like, what story is it going to be? (laughs) Now, the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, Luke 14. And the chief priests and teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or, or people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She spoke... She, she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Who is this woman? In John's Gospel, she's called Mary. And in John's Gospel, the, the perfume wasn't just poured on the head, it was poured on his feet as well. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why waste this perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages. Wowzers and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. I mean, let's just play a little object lesson. If you have $60,000 in your wallet right now, and you feel God inspired you to give it away for the kingdom, please come out now and lay it here. But please do not come out the front and get a match and light it on fire. (laughs) Do something with it. Can you imagine? I mean, look at the issues in our world. Look at the the, the needs that we have. Look at the injustice. And I mean, imagine $60,000 and burning it up and throwing it away. I'd be angry. And you know who was the angriest? This really, really godly disciple called Judas. He was so mad. 
This was the tipping point for him psychologically. In fact, in all of the go- after this event in the different Gospels, this was the moment that tipped him over the edge where he went and denied Christ. This was the moment when he went, well, not when he denied Christ, but he made up his mind to go and plot against Jesus. This was the moment where he said, I've got issues. No, no, I hate Jesus because he's messed up. I think the hatred he had towards Jesus. And get this, it says in John's Gospel, that he was the one that was the accountant. He was the accountant and he oversaw the finances and he was stealing from Jesus and from the disciples he was stealing. But he had moral outrage towards what was happening. You know, nothing in our society loves more than good moral outrage. You know what I mean? It's like, who am I to judge? Who am I to judge? Who am I to judge? But oh, no, no, you stepped out of, you crossed the line. You said the thing that you can't say. Lynch mob, let's get this person. Social media, let's shame them. Let's pile on. And what do we do when we pile on someone? Oh, gee, it makes us feel good because thank God I'm not like that person. But you are like that person, so am I. We all have capacity to make mistakes. How dare we have... We need to be really careful as Christians not to participate in the outrage culture. We disagree on issues, but we don't demonize people, please. Anyway, I digress. So Jesus... $60,000 $60,000 equivalent by today's money in little old Adelaide, I reckon. And Judas was the most outspoken. He was so puffed up with what he knew was good. And he didn't have a clue. Listen to this, verse 6. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing. This is not just good. This is Jesus saying, what this woman is doing is not just tolerable, not just allowable, but it is beautiful. The poor you will always have among you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could, and she poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, whenever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And that's what we're doing today. We're remembering what she did 2,000 years later. You see, she recognized that the, 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 the messianic figure, the savior figure in Psalm chapter 2 that would be anointed as king, that she was recognizing that Jesus, this Jewish carpenter, was a king and he was worthy of the most extravagant and reckless worship. She identified who he was more than all of his other disciples. She saw something in him was worthy of everything. And he accepted it because he didn't just accept it that it was his anointing to be a king and prophet. But he accepted it because it was his anointing to prepare him for his death. Because almost symbolically, he was saying, this is the next step in the process of me being a king that will hang on a cross. You see, the ultimate good of Jesus' life was not how many people he could help in his body. It was actually what he could do through his life and death and resurrection to save the world. And this woman understood who he was more than anyone else. You see, this might be offensive to some people, but it's only through the formation that comes from loving God with all of your heart that we are then capable of loving our neighbor as ourself. And the good things that we're called to do, injustice and mercy and kindness to others, should always come second to the worship of God. Always. And that's offensive to even say in some religious circles. You see, I believe for you to be good, like Jesus, you need to recognize it's not how many good things you can tick off a box. Because even if you tick off a whole pile of good things, you know what will happen? Pride will slip in and your heart will drift and you'll end up becoming focused on self. You see, when I was a kid and I used to vacuum the house, um, the three times I did it, um, I would put the, I would put the, 
I would put the chairs and the stools on the bench and on the table and leave them there. So when mum came home, she could see that I had disrupted the furniture. Like, it was kind of subconscious. But I did the good to receive. In fact, my good was not magnanimous at all. It was just to get in mum's good books. You see, even the good we do has strings attached sometimes. So you will never be good enough until you realise that at your heart you're not pure and good and you need a good God to redeem you and save you from the inside out. Then you can be free to serve the living God and to love your neighbour as yourself recognizing that your neighbor is also your enemy at times and you have to love your enemy as you love yourself. And and you know what? If you don't understand the scandal of loving enemy, then you haven't recognized how hard it is. It's really hard. You see, one of my other favorite stories is this one in Luke 14. (laughs) Jesus is so offensive. I love it. Luke 14 12 he, he, go, he goes to a party and he just observes you know people watch Jesus is the ultimate people watcher he's like oh, okay it's interesting that you did that do you want me just to explain what you did there I'm just the Holy Spirit's giving me a bit of an insight into what you did so he walks in to a, to a gathering in the Pharisee it's a Pharisee's house and he notices everyone sits in the good places around the table he's just like interesting I'm the son of God I haven't taken a seat yet and he just and he just says isn't it isn't it interesting that, you know, you could, you could have a, and he tells a story about like a, a, a gathering where you sit at the place of highest honor, but then you're embarrassed, but you have to get asked to sit at the other end because the important people haven't arrived yet. And he just tells that object lesson while they're sitting at the table. Kind of, how offensive is that? Who is this guy? Who invited Jesus over for dinner? Go away, Jesus. Verse 12, then Jesus said to the host, and then after he told the story, listen to this, when you have a luncheon or dinner, Do not invite your friends. What? Your brothers or your sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. I like that. You can invite your neighbors, just not your rich ones. (laughs) But if you do, they might invite you back, so you will be repaid. It's like, don't invite your friends or your rich neighbors, or else you'll get repaid. Wow, that sounds terrible. (laughs) I love this. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. So is he being metaphoric? Maybe. Maybe he's being literal. Maybe he's actually saying you need to find people with extreme disabilities and invite them into your home. How's that going for you? I wonder if you would have a map upon, if you would have a list of everyone you've dined with for the last three months right here. And you take out close family And close friends, who have you invited into your home to show hospitality to in the last three months? Wow, that's a scary proposition. And it says, invite these folks, the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. I mean, some of us are couples and we only ever have couples over. We're so clicky, we don't even have singles in our house anymore. Well, how rubbish is that? Some of us only have people of the same generation as us into our home. And he says, when you do this, you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You see, Jesus is saying, there's good that you will do and you will never get a reward in this life, but it's still good and it's the way of the kingdom. Some of the good you will do, it will make you fully alive and it will align you to Jesus and you should do it, but you will not get repaid in this life. In fact, if you're getting repaid in this life and if you're living a life that's really easy right now, then I wonder how aligned you are with the way of Jesus. You might be living the truth of Jesus and you might be living some of the moral principles of Jesus, but are you living the way of Jesus in living a good life? Not just avoiding bad, but doing the good. Reflection question number one. When was the last time you made a decision that Jesus... Actually, I'm not going to... That's the wrong question. Sorry. Number one. Am I becoming more like Jesus and his definition of goodness? That's a good question. Not... Am I going to connect group more? Am I going to church more? Do I know more? Have I got more superannuation? Am I becoming more like Jesus? If you can't say yes, 
Can I just hazard to guess that God wants you, through the Holy Spirit, to become more like Jesus and to do more good, not just to avoid evil? Second question. Am I living out the goodness of God in a way that challenges me? Man, I love this church. I love being part of the Christian Family Centre. I love living at Fulham. Like, I live in a great neighbourhood. My kids are part of a great school. And it's really challenging. Great neighbours. I can't say anything else right now. They are great. Although my mother-in-law brought some chickens around the house the other day and my kids were screaming, I want the chickens! All night. But sorry, you didn't know that, Kath. Sorry about that. <laughs> had, had my son come into my room and he's like, Daddy, I want to see the chickens. They're like 5 a.m. I'm like, thanks, Kath. Um, <laughs> true story. Okay. But am I living out the goodness of God in a way that challenges me? Uh, you know, so I just use the three-month the three month analogy of people you've actually dined with in your home. Can you please think about neighbours or people you can invite into your home that might not be as well off as you, that might not have a lot in common, but they will appreciate your hospitality? Can you do that? Because that's, that's what Jesus tells us to do explicitly. Huh. Can I also say, maybe for the last three years, have you done something that's really challenged you in the kingdom of God, where you've stepped out and it's cost you and it's risked. I mean, Nikki and I, can I just say, I just respect my wife so much for um, saying yes to Jesus in planting a church with me. Because, I mean, two years ago, she had a whole year where she didn't make it into one service for a whole year because our son Josiah was having meltdowns and and he, he, he would scream when he just like went, came into the car park. It was just a nightmare. Like it's hard being part of church when your kid can't come to church and your wife can't even support you. Your wife wants to stay at home because she's miserable the whole time. And then like eight months, two months, two years later, she's saying yes to stepping out in a courageous step, planning a church where we've got a very small team to start with and we don't know if it's going to be a success or a failure and it takes risks, risk and we're leaving a lot. We're looking at moving out like... That is costly. I wonder, and, and for some of us, like we've all got things that God calls us to that are costly, and it's an expression of our discipleship because it tests what, what, where our center is. Can I just say, um, you know, I think of <laughs> in our first gathering that we had in our church plant for CFC South, we had nine people at our first meeting, and I, I set the chairs up as a horseshoe, and um, Emmett Molinar walked in, and if you don't know Emmett, he's just an amazing guy. I haven't told you this, Emma. I've got your photo coming up in a little bit. Don't put it up yet. And, um, <laughs> um, but Emmett walked in and he goes, so, I guess I won't be sitting in the back row in this church. <laughs> it was just awesome timing. Like, it was just amazing timing. And it's like, you know what? When you're planning a church, there is no back row. There is no middle row. There's only a front row in Jesus' name. And, and that takes courage. You know, that takes courage and it costs. I think of Dan and Serenity Paisalak when they were in Tasmania and they moved to an area of Adelaide where they didn't know many, where, where they, where, where, like a neighbourhood where they didn't have most of their friends living. They could have moved out to the Adelaide Hills. They could have moved to the western suburbs, but they planted their house in Ranella because they said, we believe God wants us to be part of a church plant that's not even starting for God knows how long. Isn't that awesome? I think of Alan Charmaine Van Heerden, and I think about the fact that they, some of their closest friends are part of this fellowship at Seton, and they're setting off as part of our team with us young people. I like to think of myself as young, even though I'm middle-aged now. Um, and I just think, thank God for people that are saying yes to living out the goodness of God in a way that challenges them. Imagine, God might not be calling you to make a radical shift, but he might be calling you to make a shift in your heart, yeah? Just some photos here. These are from our church plant, CFC South. We're meeting every fortnight. We've been meeting at the Cove Civic Centre every fortnight just to grow our team and to get word out about the church, basically. And over the last kind of six to eight weeks, we have had 
many, many people, like probably between 150 and 200 people in total, different people, the different events we've been having coming through. We've had teams from Seton come down. We've had some helpers from all around just helping us to build connections with people. We've got non-Christians coming along. We've got people that haven't been in church for years coming along. We've got um, single parents. We've got people with disabilities coming along. We've got a whole pile of kids on the autism spectrum coming along. Like It's just God's bringing people along. Because people are hungry for community and they're hungry for something. And we're still forming that team. And the goal is that as our team grows, we will be in a position to launch weekly services. As of next week, we're going to be meeting at the Hallett Cove Baptist Church, who we're renting their facility in the afternoons and the evenings. And we're going to be having 4 p.m. services at the Hallett Cove Baptist Church as of this Sunday. Isn't that great? And so that can be, and that's our short term, very, 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 very short term home while we prepare for a long term lease or preferably a purchase somewhere. Now, that's faith talk there, but we believe it. We believe in the next short amount of time, we'll be able to identify a place where we can geographically plan ourselves so our church will be a church like this one that grows with the community and is there a blessing for decades to come. Amen? Um, check out this one we've done. We did a picnic, um, and uh, that's, that's Chelsea Molina. She's amazing. Her and Emmett put on this... Um, this picnic, we had over 100 people at this picnic, and half of them I've never met before, and people are just inviting their friends, inviting their family along, and it was phenomenal, and um, so we're just getting to know people, hearing their stories, and inviting them to come and be part of what God's doing. We're finding that some people that aren't even Christians yet are wanting to be part of what God's doing. Isn't that exciting? Next one. Oh, that's Emmett. He's our barista, and uh, he's doing a great job. That's our church coffee machine. Thank you to the church planning fund. Thank you for your giving that has paid for our new coffee machine. Thanks be to Jesus. Next one. And, oh, yeah. And there's Chad Van Heeren. What a legend he is. And that's our youth space, but it got taken over by young kids that time. Um, yeah, complete lack of discipline. Chad, I'll talk to you about that after. But, um, but, you know, like bumping in, bumping out. When you've got a small team, it's a lot of work. But let me tell you, it's worth it. God is not calling you just to slave away, but he's calling you at times to say yes to inconvenience for the kingdom and to do good. Okay? All right. I think I'm done. No. Final question. Why don't we stand on our feet? Three whole minutes before 12. Praise God. I'm excited. Oh man, I've missed preaching to more people than 30 people. It's exciting. It's good energy. You guys are blessed. Do you know how blessed you are to be in this church? Don't sit on it. Don't like take it for granted. You're, you're so fortunate. There are people in your life that will come along to church. They just haven't come yet because you haven't invited them. And it's not about getting them to join religion. It's just about getting them to be part of a loving community and hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. They don't even have to accept him. Like, we, we trust that Jesus will speak to people on his terms in the right timing. So we don't have to pressure people. The good news of the gospel is that God loved us before we did anything for him, even when we didn't even know. And so we just say, God, I can't do anything for you. I need you. I can't live life on my own any longer. And that's good news. It's good news that you don't have to win your way to God, that God has won the victory of sin and death by the cross and the resurrection and we can just receive his love so that we can then be free to do some of the things we've always wanted to do and God's put in our heart the way God's put us on this planet to make a difference we don't have to be someone we're not we don't have to be a professional sports person we don't have to be a professional academic it doesn't matter don't it doesn't matter where you're placed God has you there for a reason and there's a purposefulness to you being on this planet my last question is this Am I worshipping God in a manner that others may think is reckless? Think about that. Think about that blessed woman that we read about, Mary, that pours out a year's salary equivalent in love and dedication to Jesus. I wonder, maybe this morning as we finish, God doesn't want you to give Him stuff. He just wants you to say, I give you my best and the center of my life, the core of who I am belongs to you. Will you just close your eyes and maybe lift your hands and say, God, I want to worship you in a way that others might think is reckless because I do not hold to my life as my own. I have been bought at a price. I thank you 
that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I thank you that there is a purposefulness to my life and that even though I can look at all the ways where I fail and I am fallen and I fall short, that that is not my identity in Christ, that I am a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. I thank you that you want me to love my neighbour as myself. You want me to love my enemies. You want me to live by faith and not by sight. You want me to make a difference in this world. But it starts with saying, God, you are the focus of my life. You are the first love by which as I'm filled, I will have a cup that overflows to love the others in my life. I pray, God, that my definition of a good life is not framed by a tame, timid, meek, safe Jesus, but by a Jesus represented by a ferocious lion who is good and protective, but ferocious and awesome. A a lion that's willing to go into battle for us. A lion that has saved us, but also a lion that calls us to stand up straight and be courageous and move forward in saying yes to Him. We love you. We worship you. Have your way this week. May we live good lives, not through just striving, but as an overflow of your goodness in us. In Christ's name. Amen.